My name is Ben Shogan. I'm a colorectal surgeon at the University of Chicago. And I'd like to thank the program committee for giving me the honor of presenting um, on diverticulitis and some of the decisions behind what surgeries uh, should be offered. I have no disclosures. As we all know, diverticulitis is classified into two buckets, uncomplicated disease, which is 75% of the patients, really defined as just inflammation, and complicated disease, which is a quarter of the patients, defined as abscess, obstruction, fistula, or perforation. As we all know, there's a Hinchy classification, which really grades the severity of disease, four being feculent peritonitis, three being purulent peritonitis, and one, being just a pericolic abscess. Now the treatment for acute uncomplicated diverticulitis is relatively straightforward. It can be treated on an outpatient basis, it's cost-effective and safe, 95% um, resolve without admission, and very few of these patients progress to complicated diverticulitis. Many of these patients aren't even seen by a surgeon and they're treated by the primary care doctor or the, in the emergency room. Um, and there is some controversy regarding the use of antibiotics. Multiple studies have been for have, have been um, uh, conducted randomly assigning patients with uncomplicated diverticulitis antibiotics versus placebo, um, and there really is no difference in time to recovery, recurrence, intervention, or surgery rates. And the most recent recommendations are that selected young and healthy patients can be treated without antibiotics. Of course, these patients, especially after their first episode, um, need to undergo a colonoscopy uh, to rule any malignancy. Now, what most commonly happens is while the surgeon might not see these on their initial presentation, they're often referred to a surgeon after multiple episodes um, to see if prophylactic sigmoid resection is indicated. And what's important to know, of course, is that the risk of recurrence increases after each, rec after each recurrence. So after their first episode, they have about a one in five chance that they will occur in five years. But after their second episode, that goes to one in two, and this increases as the number of recurrences increase. But though, it's ex they're extremely low risk, really, no matter how many recurrences they have, of converting to a complicated diverticulitis. And thus, the current recommendations is that an individual decision to proceed to surgery should be made between the surgeon and the patient. So for me, if the patient's 30 or 40, and maybe they've had 30 or three or four episodes, I generally offer them sigmoid resection, um, especially if they're taking time out of work, um, they're, uh, they're taking time, and they're a good surgical risk. On the other hand, if they're older, have surgical comorbidities, their episodes are well treated with antibiotics, I generally won't offer them surgery, or at least I won't push them to it, and we would have a discussion about it. Now, what about for acute complicated diverticulitis? Well, if they're stable, again, it's relatively easy. They're admitted, they get antibiotics, they get percutaneous drainage. And again, these patients usually will do fine, go home. But similar to the uncomplicated, they'll often show up in the surgeon's um, clinic to discuss the need for a prophylactic a sigmoid resection. So when to operate for diverticulitis? Well, Certainly in the emergency setting. So if the patient comes and they're unstable, they have an acute abdomen, they go emergently to the operating room. In the urgent setting, where they're that compl complicated diverticulitis patient, um, where maybe they're not getting better, they continue to have abscesses, they're not getting well drained by IR, those patients need to go urgently, usually during that admission. And then usually electively, for recurrent uncomplicated diverticulitis like we discussed, for smoldering disease, those are the patients who really don't get better in between episodes. Uh, they might have peaks and valleys, but in the valleys, they're really not back to their baseline. Those patients uh, will benefit from a sigmoid resection. And then an elective for complicated disease, um, and the current indications for that, again, these are patients with complicated disease and they get home, but maybe they have a persistent abscess on imaging, that the original abscess was greater than five centimeters, they have fistula or a chronic obstruction, these are the current indications for, for prophylactic sigmoid resection. So the real question is what operation to perform. As we all know, there's three things we can do. We can do sigmoid resection with primary anastomosis. We can do sigmoid resection with ileostomy. Um, and we can do um, a Hartman's procedure with a sigmoid resection and a, and a end colostomy. So let's go through the easy scenarios first. Number one, that patient um, who is, has uncomplicated episodes or the patient who had a complicated episode but fully resolved, um, clearly the ideal pr procedure for them is a sigmoid resection 
primary anastomosis, they get their operation, they heal, they're in essence done, just about cured of their disease. The other easy scenario is a patient that comes into the emergency room is hypotensive, tachycardic, you know, they're peritonitic, you're rushing them to the operating room, maybe they're on vasopressors. The goal of that operation is to get rid of their sepsis, take out the sigmoid, get them off the table, give them a Hartman's resection, or a Hartman's procedure, and colostomy and come to fight another day. Those are the easy scenarios. What about the patients in between? Those patients that have persistent abscesses or come in and they're stable, maybe they have feculent peritonitis, but they're really not crashing upon your eyes. What do we do for those patients? Well, um, this has been studied well, actually. Um, this is the most recent multi-center trial uh, with patients with Hinchy 3 or 4. Um, only Hinchy 3 or 4, Hinchy 1 and 2 were excluded. And it was a randomized controlled trial between Hartman's and a sigmoid resection, plus or minus an ileostomy. The ileostomy with a sigmoidectomy, um, uh, I'm sorry, the ileostomy with the primary anastomosis was up to the, the operating surgeon. And I want to go over kind of three results here. So one, there is no difference in post-op morbidity or outcomes after patients who go to Hartman's versus a, a sigmoid resection and primary anastomosis. There's no difference. Surgical intervention was the same. Abscess with drainage was the same. Surgical site infection was the same. Their ICU needs were the same. And their post-operative stay was the same. Now, again, the use of a diverting loop ileostomy was um, up to the operating surgeon if they performed a primary anastomosis. And um, they did a subgroup analysis. It wasn't powered, but they actually show that there was no difference in those patients with a primary anastomosis who got an ileostomy versus now. We'll talk about that a little bit more in a few slides from now. Um, number two is that um, when the patients did get their, their ostomy taken down, um, no surprise, there was significantly increased morbidity following some reversal in Hartman's patients compared to ileostomy. A Hartman's uh, takedown is a hard procedure um, and should not be any surprise that that is harder to do with more morbidity compared to diverting with ileostomy takedown. And then three, at 12 months, um, somer free survival was significantly higher in the primary anastomosis group. There were significantly more patients with an end colostomy versus a diverting loop ileostomy at 12 months. Now this is one of a handful of multiple randomized trials, um, all showing really the, almost the exact same results. And thus the current recommendation um, for these patients as in hemodynamically stable patients, primary anastomosis is preferable to Hartman's procedure, um, even with perulent, perulent and fecal peritonitis, again, if they're, if they're relatively stable. Now what about, if you're gonna perform a primary anastomosis, when should you perform a diverting loop ileostomy? This is a little bit less clear. In the prior RCTs that I talked about, the decision to divert was left to the surgeon. When subgroup analysis was performed and there's been multiple NISQIP um, analyses of this, they've shown no major differences in both the demographics or the postoperative outcomes, but there is a trend towards increased postoperative sepsis without an ileostomy. Um, and of course, um, because it was not controlled for, you could easily imagine that there's a significant selection bias in when the surgeon was choosing a diversion or not. And thus, the decision really remains up to the surgeon based upon how the anastomosis comes together and the amount of sepsis present in the pelvis. Um, and at least for myself, I think if you're unsure, I would just divert, taking that diverted loop ileostomy three or four months later is a relatively straightforward procedure. Now, oh, those ureters. Of course, when you're in the pelvis, um, that's the thing that's really on everybody's mind. Um, luckily, it is rare to injure the ureters, um, but it certainly does happen. Um, it's estimated to, to have a ureteral injury somewhere between 0.1 to 5%. The most common place, at least for diverticulitis, is right over that pelvic brim. And this is because you have, that is where you have your sigmoid inflammation kind of plastered there and you need quite a bit of dissection to free it up and the ureter is, is sitting right underneath. Kind of the classic teaching is that stents help identify injury, um, but not prevent it. And this is a hard thing to study, um, of course, because it's a, it's a rare outcome. And there was a recent meta-analysis of 22 articles invested in the use of stenting in colorectal surgery. Um, and with a stent, they found that the ureteral injury was about 1.5%. With no stent, it was 0.17%. And this is clearly um, 
you know, due to selection bias that those surgeons um, that thought it was going to be hard dissection, maybe a tumor sitting there or diverticulitis got a stent. Um, um, and there was certainly some selection there. Um, intraop recognition was almost about the same, kind of to the surprise of, of the authors and to other publications, um, that when you do have a stent, the intraop recognition of a, of a, um, a ureteral injury was about the same. Now, I would say that this certainly isn't conclusive. Um, these are low frequency events. Um, and my myself, if I have someone I'm going in that has pelvic sepsis, I almost always put a stent in. There's, there's very, very low risk of complications with a stent. Um, I just wanted to bring this up um, as my second to last slide is if you're doing this laparoscopically or robotically, or even if you um, are doing it open, you can do this technique. You could have the urologist um, place some indesign in green in the ureter right before they put a stent in. Um, and then you can use Firefly and the robot or a similar uh, technology on most laparoscopic cameras now that easily allow you to identify the ureter. And because when I find that, especially with all the inflammation, it's really hard to tell what's, what's ureter, stent, um, or just scar tissue. And when you have this, you can easily you see, and this is something I've been doing almost routinely now. So with that, just a few take-home points. One, sigmoid resection and primary anastomosis is the procedure of choice for recovered, uncomplicated, or complicated diverticulitis. Sigmoid resection and primary anastomosis with ileostomy, I would say, appear safe and in healthy patients with complicated diverticulitis, even with purulent or fecal peritonitis. And use of stenting or diverting ileostomy is up to the operating surgeon. And again, I want to thank Sages very much for the honor. Um, and I'm happy to answer any questions during the panel.